What a good class. Good morning. morning. What a day, huh? We're sitting here with the windows open. Don't anybody look out the window. You always have to look at whoever's speaking up here, being recognized up here this morning. But it is kind of tough because you do want to look out that window and enjoy the the scenery with the pond and spring on a beautiful springtime morning. Uh, My name is Jim Mathis. I have the privilege of being your master of ceremonies this morning as the chairman of the Cooperative Education Advisory Board, a role which I have proudly held uh, from the beginning of the program. This is our 26th year for cooperative education at Bristol Community College. Uh, and, And I just, I love coming to this every year because I know how important it is to the individuals who are in the room, in particular the students and the employers, uh, but also because I think it's, it's one of the things that distinguishes this college from others uh, throughout uh, the Northeastern United States. Some of you, because we somewhat take it for granted having been here such, for such a long time, and uh, just talking with Peg, and the estimate is probably over those 25 years, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 students who have completed co-op Uh, programs here. Uh, We take it for granted, but this doesn't happen easily and it doesn't happen at all community colleges and it certainly doesn't happen at this level. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to recognize some people who have been very important to the program here. You're going to hear uh, a little bit later from Peg Curro, who's the director, but I also want to introduce, in addition to Peg, other staff who are here. The co-op coordinator, Nicole Heaney, if you could give a wave, I'd appreciate it. The New Bedford Co-op Advisor, we have with us Ann Cazera, over here. And the Attleboro Co-op Advisor, Nanette Loggins. Also working closely with Co-op, we uh, we have the Connecting Activity staff, I believe both are here. I saw one for sure, Zelia Lagarde and Kristen Almeida. And additionally, a couple of faculty uh, who are here with us, uh, co-op faculty. We have Cynthia Wolf and Renate Oliver. And, the, and my colleagues on the advisory board who are here, uh, sincerely want to thank them for their willingness to give up their time and to be part of this program. We have Camille Anderson from the Bedford Police Department. Camille. Bob Andrioni from Precise, Bob. Nancy Costa from Phillips Lightelier. Again, Dr. Ann Cazera, who uh, retired from the New Bedford Public Schools. The President of the New Bedford Area Chamber of Commerce, Roy Nascimento. And Tanya Picard from South Coast Hospitals. We're here today to to celebrate the success of of, uh, some of the uh, co-op matches that took place this year, students and and their employers, and and a great job that that, uh, some of the employers have done as well. Uh, I think we should point out that when we talk about the cream of the crop this year, it's a pretty big crop. Uh, Peg tells me there are 256 students who participated in cooperative education here this year. So that's that's a very strong program. Uh, It's my pleasure now to introduce someone who I greatly admire, one of my mentors and and, uh, and a guy uh, who who deserves a lot of recognition for doing a tremendous amount, not just for this college, not just for this community, but for the entire South Coast and Southeastern Massachusetts region. Jack Spraga came here about 13 years ago, uh, and this college has grown in size, in enrollment, and in significance, and in impact measurably in every community since then. Uh, I can speak directly to what I saw happen in the community where I spend most of my time, which is in New Bedford, where uh, through embracing new programs and growing the student population there and establishing a campus, New Bedford now has, I believe, uh, in excess of 200 courses, in excess of 2,000 students, and I've learned last night from talking with uh, someone on, uh, uh, on the fo- BCC Foundation staff that the same thing is now beginning to happen in Attleboro. And they're seeing tremendous growth there too. Those things don't happen by accident. They happen because of good planning. They happen because of good leadership. And the guy who has seen to it that all of this has happened here and, and this growth, and not just in size, but in meaningful impact 
on people's lives and on our community is the person we hear from next. The President of BCC, Jack Sprague. Well, thank you, Jim. That was a wonderful, uh, I'll live up to that introduction. But, uh, and Jim, you know, actually, I must say, <clears throat> is a hero of mine. Uh, Jim was uh, very comfortable as president of the New Bedford uh, Chamber of Commerce, making lots of money. He's rich, you know, making a, <laughs> right, Roy? Uh, <laughs> and, and he gave it up uh, to uh, follow his, uh, his real dream and the thing that's dear to his heart, and that is education. And he uh, founded the uh, SMILES, the mentoring program, which is so badly needed all across the region, not just in New Bedford. Uh, so uh, for someone to take that bold step uh, and, to, uh, and to make a success of it, uh, I, I just can't uh, tell you how much I admire all the things that Jim have done. And I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> You know, with the uh, levels of literacy in this region and the levels of education uh, attainment in this region, uh, both very low, uh, we need to do everything we can to bolster those activities. And uh, Jim's efforts are uh, very, you know, very instrumental in in that campaign. Uh, but so is the uh, cooperative education. Bring me back to cooperative education. I did want to point out one other person in the room that I wanted to recognize for you, and that's the executive director of our Connect. Uh, co consortium, uh, Kathleen Kirby, uh, Dr. Kirby. <laughs> Connect, as you may know, is uh, a coalition of the six public higher education institutions in the region uh, and three community colleges, Cape Cod and Massasoit, as well as Bristol and uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and two state universities, uh, uh, Bridgewater State University and the uh, Maritime Academy. So uh, very uh, happy uh, Kathleen was able to join us uh, for this great event. And we're celebrating cooperative education. Uh, you know, one thing, I, I want to be brief here, but one thing I just wanted to point out that there is plenty of literature in, uh, uh, about higher education and probably education in general about student engagement, how important it is for students to become engaged in what they do uh, and in their learning. And uh, what better example than cooperative education? Uh, and I always say it might be too simplified, but we, we mix the theory from the classroom uh, with the practice uh, in the, the real world. Uh, and to put those together, it becomes what I call a holistic education. I mention this for service learning. I mention this for internships that we have. Uh, I mention this for the clinicals, uh, uh, placements in our health programs. And the same for cooperative education. This is a uh, talk about a taste of the real world. They're out in the, in the community, uh, right in the world of business, learning. Our students are learning uh, the theory that they have in the, uh, in the um, classroom they're putting into practice and they see how it actually works and how it fits and that's why I like to brag about the holistic education that uh, students at BCC can uh, uh, enjoy uh, and I want a final thank you to uh, all of the employers and the community organizations that have provided these placement opportunities for our students. And it's not easy in this climate, this economic climate. And uh, Nicole and Peg uh, deserve absolutely all the shout outs we can give them uh, for trying to find these placements. And uh, again, for the employers and the corporations and the organizations, I can't tell you how grateful we are for the educational value uh, that uh, you have provided. And I hope in turn you are receiving value as well. Uh, from the uh, interacting with our BCC students. So let's get on with this wonderful program of awards and recognition. Thank you very much. I also want to uh, uh, let you know we have another special guest with us here this morning. He actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is the longest serving state representative in all of southeastern Massachusetts. From New Bedford, State Representative Bob Cazera. Bob, thank you. Well, I told you that we've been doing this for 26 years, and for the majority of that time, the lady who has uh, run this program and put together a team uh, that works on co-op that's second to none is Peg Currow. 
she has done nothing short of, a, of just an outstanding job at building co-op and sustaining the program here for the benefit of thousands of students. And with the participation and support of uh, a lot of folks here on campus and employers throughout the region. So please welcome our director, Peg Curl. Thank you, Jim. Today's a day to celebrate the success of our students and to thank our community partners. So I just want to give you a little wrap up of what we've accomplished this year. Uh, we have had 256 students that have enrolled in co-op. We probably do career counseling with double that number. Um, we've worked with over 200 employers and uh, we've worked with large companies, we've worked with small companies, profit for-profit, non-profit companies, government organizations. So we've had a very big and busy year. And none of that would have been possible without the wonderful uh, people that are in the co-op program. All of them have been recognized at this point by Jim, so thank you very much for that. Um, one additional person I would like to uh, thank our Vice President of Academic Affairs, our Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, Mike Vieira, for his leadership. We, were, we report directly to Mike. And another person who is not on the program, but served with us for six years as our office manager, Deb Line. She recently left to take, uh, to actually start her own business after finishing her bachelor's and a master's degree after graduating from Bristol Community College. So all our students go very far and we're happy for her success and uh, we are, we wish her well. Uh, also in the uh, Connecting Activities grant out of the Greater, we partner with the Greater New Bedford uh, Area Chamber of Commerce. And it's been 12 years now, 13 years, Roy, perhaps. So it's been a long partnership. And this year, in addition to the two Bristol community staff, there is a new employer liaison, and that's Robin Branco. And I'd like to have Robin just stand up for a second because the employers who are out there if you're looking to work with high school students, this is an internship program with high school students, Robin is the person that you contact. So thank you, Robin. We, uh, I want to keep my comments very short this year. I just want to talk about one upcoming initiative that we've, we've started. And I'm very happy to see that Dr. Kirby is here from the Connect Group. Um, we are working on a consortium uh, database for employers in the region to be able to do internship postings to all of the colleges in the Connect Group. Uh, and uh, we're going to be working on this in the upcoming years, so I'm going to be asking some employers for some advice and support and some help with that. So expect to hear about that one. Uh, and the other outcome this year that I found very surprising after doing this for 26 years, the economy is always the economy. <laughs> And we've had a couple of down years where um, students have certainly done internships and they've had wonderful outcomes, educational outcomes, but sometimes the jobs haven't been there. It's, it's been a very tough economy. This year, things have seemed to turn around. And so many of our students are receiving job offers this particular year. It gives me great hope for the region, great hope for the program, and great hope for the students who are graduating from here this year. Uh, we've had more and more reports on that. And I, I don't have an absolute number because I'm still counting them. <laughs> so uh, perhaps things are turning around. And during this tough economy uh, over the last few years, our keynote speaker today really took a very interesting attack on that problem. He actually managed to find 50 jobs in 50 states in 50 weeks. You're going to have lots of questions for him afterwards, after his presentation. And uh, he's uh, accomplished a lot. What, I'm, what we're going to do is I turn this over to him after he speaks and after our award ceremony at the end. Uh, he's going to have a book signing, his book, 50 Jobs in 50 States, outside. The book you can buy at the bookstore and come over. But even if you just want to stop by and chat with him and ask him questions, because I think you're going to have a lot of questions after he even finishes, to find out how he did this very interesting journey, finding out about himself 
and about our great country. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote today, Daniel Siddiqui. All right, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very honored. Thank you, Peg, for bringing me here today from Chicago. Came in yesterday. Uh, surprisingly, I made the trip uh, because it's very tough to drive on these roads in Massachusetts. Uh, I feel like sometimes these pe these drivers should be charged with uh, attempted murder, you know. But uh, regardless of that, I had a great experience in Massachusetts as my 45th job in state. I was a baseball scout for the Brockton Rocks, uh, stayed and lived with the uh, mayor of Brockton at the time, and also I met my fiance that week. Uh, I got engaged like two months ago, so <laughs> a lot of good things happened in Massachusetts, so I'm glad to be back. So today I'm going to talk about the power of experiential learning and uh, how the 50 jobs in 50 states played a big role in my personal development. So we learn a lot of essential life skills growing up through our school systems and also extracurricular activities. These are just some of the uh, things that I've learned. Um, my extracurricular activity happens to be track and field and cross country. Uh, so learning how to be competitive, goal setting, uh, being internally driven. But nothing really prepares you for the real world and that's why we're here today to talk about what the kids are facing now. The real world is very different. It doesn't, re the school and, and growing up, it doesn't really prepare you to deal with rejection, doesn't deal, learn to teach you about different types of people, taking risks, being adaptable, learning how to go out of your comfort zone. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today, different elements that I learned from experiencing uh, 50 jobs in 50 states and what we can take away from that. So when, coming out of college, I went to the University of Southern California. I studied economics. Uh, I graduated in 2005, and I was looking for a full-time job for three years, and all the way until 2008, when the recession started to hit. So then things got even worse. So I was like, OK, completely lost, confused. I had no direction. Um, no one believed in me, and even my parents were really hard on me. They actually called me a loser and a disgrace to my alma mater, USC. So they, they told me, you know, go see a therapist to go see if something's wrong with you, you know. So it got to that point where I was really down on my luck and I felt like the world was against me. So I put some of the emotions that I went through looking for a job, you know. Coming out, you have a lot of optimism and hope and, and uh, confidence, but when you get rejected, that's hard. Um, so. Then I came up with the idea to do 50 jobs in 50 states, and this was my 32nd job. I was a park entertainer at Universal Studios. Now, the theme is turning rejection into opportunity. This might not seem like an opportunity for most people, but the idea and putting energy into it, that, that's what really the opportunity was. So I was standing there in disbelief. A year before this picture was taken, I was three, year, uh, three years unemployed, no money, no support from anybody, and now I'm having a big employer like Universal buying into my idea and working as an Egyptian stilt walker. Um, I said, okay, I could do anything. I could even be a weatherman for NBC in, Chica in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So I was on the 4.30 a.m. shift. Uh, no one really watches that time anyway, so that's probably why they put me on that slot. Plus in Cleveland, you can't predict the weather, so you're always wrong. <laughs> So this is the cover of my book and basically describes why I went on this journey. It's about not only discovering myself, but also this country. And you know, being born and raised in California, you feel very limited living in a bubble. And I really wanted to go out and discover different things I didn't know existed. Different cultures, careers, environments, different industries, of course. And then turning rejection into opportunity and a dream into reality. So I began by composing a resume uh, my resume now does not fit on one page uh, like it used to when I first graduated. But uh, I composed a resume thinking, laying out the idea, because I had to sell this idea to myself before I can go out and pitch it to other people, especially, you know, the 
my, my parents, you know, I had to sell this idea to them to have them support me, at least emotionally. Uh, but when I sent the, my resume uh, by email to them, they didn't even bother to open it up. They said, you know, this is a waste of time and it's destined to fail. So that actually gave me some encouragement, actually. I took that negative energy and made it positive. But I thought I would choose jobs that reflect the culture and economy of every state to really see what shapes this country. So I worked with the Mormons in Utah. Uh, I was a rodeo announcer in South Dakota. Let's see, corn farmer in Nebraska, a park ranger in Wyoming, logger in Oregon, border patrol agent in Arizona, a meat packer in Kansas, made cheese in Wisconsin, auto mechanic in Detroit, a coal miner in West Virginia, and even a high school football coach in Alabama. So I call my journey living the map. So. This was my chance to really live my dream. Uh, even as a 10-year-old, I used to stare at maps, envisioning how different people lived in, in each state, how different I would be if I grew up in Massachusetts versus Maine versus Florida or wherever. So I was a very curious person, and curiosity and desperation, that combination made me have that ambition to go on this, on this journey. But as I mentioned, no money, no support. How was I going to fund this travel? So I thought I would look for sponsors. Now, I didn't even own a vehicle at the time either, so I reached out to Jeep and Ford, anything that were, could really help me on my journey, but they all turned me down. Uh, even energy drink companies, because I knew this would be an endurance challenge, um, but they also rejected me. Good thing I was already used to rejection at this point, thanks to all those girls that I asked out growing up uh, through school and college, but uh, GPS turned me down. They didn't care if I got lost, you know, but... <laughs> So I had to take a loan out of the bank. I never used credit card at that point in my life, and I had a $5,000 credit limit, a line of credit. So there I am standing with $5,000, and, and I bought a Jeep Cherokee, and I just let, hit the road and let whatever happened happen. And that's what I'm going to talk about, adaptability. Coming up with a creative and resourceful solution to get yourself to where you want to go. And this is the first element I'm going to talk about out of, out of the five. And not only that, but also had to adapt to different people and environments, um, like a rodeo in South Dakota. Anyone ever been to a rodeo before? Uh, not, not too many of you. If I asked that question in South Dakota, everyone would raise their hand. Some people would say, yeah, I compete in a rodeo, you know, so it's very different. So I, I went in there with just sneakers and shorts and a t-shirt, and obviously I didn't look like I fit in with all these uh, cowboys. Even my Jeep was very small to these trucks and trailers. So I had to do the best I could to adapt to fit the parts. So there I am adapting in the background with a cowboy hat and, and Wranglers and I got a belt, belt buckle and, and uh, boots. And this gentleman here, if you guys can see it well, um, he asked me, where am I staying while I'm in South Dakota? Because he actually gave me that wardrobe. And in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, hopefully not with you, because you're very scary looking. <laughs> but I said, you know, I have to be adaptable. I have to be open-minded and uh, really go out of my comfort zone. So I trusted him, and I followed him home, I, even though I envisioned that he's going to bring me to a rusted trailer, and I was going to sleep on a dirty carpet with a dog drooling on my face or something. Uh, but he led me to an enormous ranch and introduced me to his beautiful family and they took me horseback riding and fed me to a steak dinner and every other night they fed me to a steak dinner. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to start trusting strangers from now on, which I did. So I found a host family in every state from Mississippi to uh, Michigan. This was George, Southern Georgia, Amish in Pennsylvania, Hawaiians, and even a cheesehead in Wisconsin. So I realized how powerful networking was, and networking is essentially marketing. I always had to market my, my mission, uh, myself, um, always having a positive attitude um, in, or, in order for people to refer me and, and, uh, and uh, take note of who I am and what my mission is. Uh, so you could do that in many different ways, uh, marketing or networking, through face-to-face -face contact, even I was totally going out of my comfort zone and coming out of my shell, uh, even on a New York City subway train, telling people about what I was doing, 
Um, and people would ask me, what do you want to do in Massachusetts? And I said, well, I, don't, I want to play baseball for the Boston Red Sox. And they said, oh, good luck with that, you know. But, uh, and then actually an opportunity did come. I was able to find that job in Brockton, Massachusetts as a baseball scout because I did talk to a stranger in New York City, even though it's very awkward even my eye contact with them. Uh, but uh, Bill Murray owns that team, so he happened to know Bill Murray. And uh, so I got to sit with Bill Murray during one of the games. So opportunities do come if you uh, come out of your shell and uh, not be scared to approach strangers sometimes. But social media is another way of doing it. Facebook, Twitter, uh, I even created my own website to market to um, potential employers. Google search is how I found many of my jobs. I would just Google search um, meat packing plants in Kansas and about 300, 400 companies would pop up and I would call every single one of them asking for a position. Um, that's why I suffered 5,000 rejections over the course of uh, 50 uh, weeks, consecutive weeks. Um, so as we go through the uh, corn bill, I did agronomy in Iowa, um, Nebraska corn farming. And I did uh, different hobbies as well. Host families and employers wanted to really share their lifestyles and uh, entertain me. So I went hunting in Montana, of course, which is a big hobby there. Uh, let's see, this battery must be low. Um, now, I didn't know much about hunting. Uh, it's not a big hobby in California, uh, neither is fishing, but. Uh, I thought you can just, you know, uh, carry a gun and start shooting things. I didn't know that you need a license, you know, or I didn't know there's particular seasons. Um, but yeah, fishing also. I caught 12 northern pike in Minnesota and I uh, had to throw nine of them back because I didn't realize there's a limit on how many you can catch as well. But, you know, sang in a Je Baptist church choir in Alabama. Um, so I did all sorts of hobbies um, and tried different foods as well. So can anyone take a guess on what this is? You can find this in Idaho. Baked potato, right? Well, it's actually uh, an ice cream potato, if you can believe that. This is vanilla ice cream powder with brown sugar. And then the uh, whipped, cream, whipped cream emulating uh, sour cream there. Logging in Oregon was probably one of the toughest jobs. Uh, as you can see, he's carrying a 60-pound chainsaw, three feet long, um, and uh, six, maybe 16 to 18 hours a day we were working, and uh, five hours of commuting um, time uh, day to day. And I was like, wow, these guys work very hard, long hours, uh, seven days a week. When do these guys get a vacation? Then I realized they have to stop at the liquor store on the way home. So that was considered, you know, their vacation. Does anyone want to guess what I did in uh, Nevada? I'm going to play a quick video of what I did there. Any, you want to shout it out? What is Nevada known for? Casinos. That's a. I was actually a reverend, as you can see here. <laughs> So I married two couples while I was there. Uh, also, I was a florist, so you see the flower arrangement. I, was, I did that. And also a limo driver and a photographer, so I was a one-man band there. And now, I wasn't good at all these jobs. Um, of course not. And um, that was one of them. I got hired at the end of each week um, for a full-time job offer by 48 out of the 50 jobs. Um, so that show, shows there's some flaws in the employment process. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Meatpacking in Kansas uh, was probably my most uncomfortable job, as you can imagine, working in a slaughterhouse. Um, so I don't need to go in depth with there. I don't want to play a video of that. But uh, I was a boiler maker in a coal fire power plant. Now everything I'm showing you today is, was new to me because you don't see most of this in the West Coast, yeah, like a power plant uh, made from coal or oil fields in Oklahoma, petroleum engineering in Texas uh, for Chevron. And these are all the active oil wells you see in the Gulf of Mexico, which was really eye-opening. Uh, Texas was my first time going there. And the state definitely lets you know that you're in their state. You know, they got a lot of pride. Their flag is waving everyone. Anyone ever been to Texas before? Yeah, you guys probably noticed that, right? Even a sandwich shop called Texadelphia. Uh, now, I remember ordering a T-bone steak at a restaurant. Uh, and the waiter was like, you mean Texas T-bone steak? I'm like, yeah, Texas T-bone steak, yeah. So um, this was my meal in Mississippi. I didn't recognize any of this food. Um, <laughs> 
Actually, the waitress was wondering why I was taking pictures of the menu. Uh, but everything, as you can see, is brown from being deep fried. Even the water is brown. No, <laughs> that's actually sweet tea. But uh, sweet tea is like water in the South. Even the high school football team that I was coaching, the Gatorade container on the sidelines was filled with sweet tea. Um, but this inspired me to pursue uh, a, a, a job as a dietitian in our most obese state of Mississippi. 30% um, of the state is classified as obese and uh, these were some of my co-workers were working on the food line here one day in the hospital and then I worked alongside a registered dietitian uh, in the hospital as well and this actually became my favorite job uh, because it was just absolutely rewarding and knowing that you can make a positive difference uh, and a change uh, for people who may be not motivated or inspired to eat right and stay active um, and that would definitely relate to my athletic background as well. So that was my favorite job and I would never have known unless I got that real life exposure. Um, but Louisiana, I was a bartender on Bourbon Street during Mardi Gras and uh, I had never drank in my life before, so I had no idea what I was doing, just like the wedding chapel. Um, but yeah, people would ask me for a Jack and Coke, and I was like, who's Jack, you know? So, um, but this became an endurance challenge, as you can imagine. You know, working all these jobs, setting up the jobs as I was going, and sleeping four hours a night for a whole year. And of course, the 600 to 800 mile drives in between states. Um, this week alone, I was on my 25th week, um, I got held up at gunpoint in Detroit and uh, as you can expect in the most dangerous city in America, but uh, I was with you know, a family who was not intimidated by this at all. Uh, the guy came to shop with the gun and he threatened us and, and uh, the employer said, well, how about you give us money? They brought out their own shotgun. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> That's the culture of uh, Detroit, I guess, but as you guys probably see on Hardcore Pond, that show, it's pretty funny. But uh, I was also staying with a Lebanese family, and they had a big ball of raw meat on my plate. And I was like, shouldn't this be cooked? And they said, no, this is how we do it. So uh, being adaptable as I was, I tried it, and I ended up going to an emergency room uh, with a stomach virus. So sometimes you have to make a judgment as you're, you're going to make uh, adapting. Uh, I worked on the pit crew for a winning Indy 500 team in Indianapolis. Um, Kentucky, I'll show you what I did in Kentucky. Anyone want to take a guess what I did in Kentucky? What are they known for? Horses, all right. You'll be shocked about what I did with the horses now. Nothing too dirty, but. <laughs> so my employer called me at 2.30 in the morning and he asked me, do you want to come follow mayor? You know, with this thick Kentucky accent. And I was like thinking, why do I want to trick a politician? I thought he was saying, why do you want to fool a mayor? You know, I was like, why don't you? Yeah. So as you go further south, the, the accents get uh, thicker. Even when I was cold calling in a peanut shelling plant in southern Georgia, I couldn't tell if the employer was hiring me or not, you know, so. Let's see. 
So as you reach down to the south, the Bible Belt, as they call it, you know, see anti-abortion signs uh, even in the Midwest. A uh, statue of Jesus in a public space is very rare to see in the West Coast. And this is Oprah Winfrey's church in Mississippi Delta that she built. Uh, this is the different types of hairstyles. This is the football team that I've noticed, different types of hairstyles, the frat swoop they call it. As you can see, they all go to the same barber shop. This is different living accommodations that I found. I stayed on a resort in uh, Kiowa Island, South Carolina, as a golf caddy. So it was about $1,000 a night they put me up. And then uh, the contrast of living in a trailer in Wyoming in the middle of the woods uh, by myself there was very scary. Uh, Vermont made syrup with his family uh, in the log cabin in the ranch in Montana in the adobe style homes you see in uh, New Mexico. I don't know if you guys can see it that well. Is the lighting okay? So uh, as I um, reached West Virginia, I, I, I knew I was taking risks, uh, of course, along the way, financial, emotional, physical risks, but nothing would compare uh, anything I've ever gone through that, to coal mining in West Virginia. Anyone ever been inside of a coal mine before? Uh, you should know it's, it's very intimidating. Um, going four miles into the earth, uh, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to go that far. And when I got down there, you see, I saw um, about 30 miners that have been down there for two to three days at a time, eating, sleeping, everything, just living down there. And uh, it gave me a real appreciation for what people do and really what's, you know, helping our, our economy flourish is are, are, are these type of jobs that I'm showing you. That's why I chose all these jobs that really shaped this country. Um, so I thought, okay, I gotta have the guts to be able to do this for a week when most people are doing it through generations at a time. So six months after I left is when that big explosion happened and 20 something people died in the same area as this mine that I worked. So that's why I put risk taking here. Um, even driving on these roads in West Virginia seems like a risk, but it's all about what are you willing to discover, and that's what risk taking is all about. Pennsylvania, I worked with the Amish. Um, I don't know if you can see it that well, but I try to fit my, the, the part as Amish. I grew a beard to lie in my jaw, as you see there. No suspenders yet on that day, but uh, I didn't realize that was only for men that are married. So when I uh, asked the Amish girl out that week, uh, she thought I was cheating on my wife, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I did find uh, a girlfriend, which is my fiance now, on the journey. Um, and I, was th I waited towards the end because I knew I'd find somebody better down the road. I didn't want to settle too soon. Because um, there was this girl I liked in state number four in North Dakota, but then I thought, you know what, I might f find somebody better, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> But Amish country, you know, I only could base, you know, uh, everything on assumptions or stereotypes. So I went into uh, Lancaster County thinking that they would carry candle lights around whenever it got dark. But I realized they have a propane tank, you know, that they would roll around wherever needed. Uh, you knew which one was Amish family when you see all the clothes hanging out to dry or the propane tank outside the yard. Uh, one day I even worked um, on the farm uh, with a conformed Amish. He didn't like, you know, camera around. He didn't, you know, like modernization. Um, so that's why I took a picture with his back turned. Uh, but he was hiding a tractor inside of his barn in case the horses couldn't carry the load. So <laughs> um, as I reached up to the East Coast, I worked in Manhattan as a marketing, Boys and Girls Club in New Jersey, sold insurance in Connecticut. Uh, Massachusetts, as I mentioned, uh, worked in, in Brockton for the uh, Brockton Rocks. And in Maine, I was a lobster fisherman, which was probably uh, the toughest job for me. That and making cheese. Anyone ever been on a, not only a lobster boat, but out in the ocean and been seasick before? Yeah, it's pretty brutal. So I got seasick after just 20 minutes of being on the boat. And they don't turn the boat around for you. So uh, they were out there for 10 hours, and so I was having the worst day of my life. I wanted to just kind of throw myself overboard. Um, even the next day I showed up, same thing happened. Third day, same thing happened. Fourth day, he was, the employer was surprised I showed up, you know. And he said, I know you're a persistent person, but I think it's time for you to move on and do something else. Just go build lobster traps instead. So that's what I did for the rest of the week. Um, so perseverance is 
It's all about making an assessment and a judgment as you're pursuing something. Just like I did with economics, failing 40 job interviews was enough for me to know it's time to move on and find an alternative avenue for success. Um, and that's kind of what I learned from being a lobsterman. There's only sometimes you, you can't control the outcome of everything. You only can do the best you can um, and you have to continuously make judgments as you're pursuing your goals. So as I finished off, I drove, or no, I didn't drove, drive to Alaska, I flew to Alaska um, and Hawaii. I was a surfing instructor. In California, I worked at a winery in Napa Valley. And uh, now that I'm done, um, I've created a college program, and maybe we can implement this at the school here, uh, where kids get to try different jobs and industries in a rapid prototyping uh, way where they get fi try five jobs five weeks in potentially five different states and I already have the host host family set up for them through rotary clubs uh, rotary members um, so that would be a good way for them to learn not only what would be fulfilling but something that would fit their personality uh, and just find something that's rewarding and worth pursuing and you never know unless you get that exposure and that's what we're all here about that's what you guys is cool co-op program is all about is because uh, you don't want to graduate college like I did kind of lost and confused and not knowing which avenue to take uh, it's better that you know and invest your time and energy into something that's worth pursuing so that's my presentation hope you all enjoyed it <laughs> you need we have a few extra minutes here for after that wonderful presentation. And I'd just like to open it up for questions because there's always so many. So if you have a question, could you stand up and say it very loudly? What do your parents think of you now? <laughs> well, I got to say, when they saw me on CNN, they're like, OK, I, I know this guy. Yeah, I, we've been supporting him all along, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They told all their, you know, friends and colleagues. Yeah, we we told them uh, to do this. No, just <laughs> uh, yeah, back there. Did you say what you did in Rhode Island? Oh, good question. Yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. Um, I work for the as an ambassador of tourism at Newport, which is actually uh, where I want to get married because there I might get a discount. So, uh, <laughs> yes. I didn't. It was just learning by doing and the, and the employers trusting me and taking that risk. So it had to be a risk on both sides. Um, but that's why I also suffered 5,000 rejections. That's how many people didn't want to be a part of it. Um, and plus I was um, honest about wanting to work just for a week. And a lot of employers just didn't want to commit the time and energy into that. Um, so, yes, question? <laughs> Honestly, I was in the same boat. With a scary cowboy like that, I was in the same boat. Um, no, it's just, uh, w when I was just desperate and curious, and it, it, it got to the point where I had to do whatever I needed to do, uh, no matter who I was or what I've experienced in the past. Because i a very shy person to start with. Um, I typically don't take big risks like this but when I was in the position I was in I had nothing to lose and uh, that's probably why I, uh, everything I, I felt like was happened for a reason all those three years of suffering after college really did create the person that I am to be able to handle a mission like that so but I don't encourage people to do this I would never do it again <laughs> this whole thing no I wouldn't do it again I, I kind of yeah, but I definitely, it was rewarding, no doubt about it. But, but if you, you are a female and you do want to do it, if you implement these five elements I talked about, anyone can do it. So, any other questions? Yes, in the front. How many miles did you drive How many miles did I drive total? Probably 28,000. All, all on the weekend drive. So, uh, and spent about $6,000 on gas. It was a historic high. 4.99 a gallon and when I left in California so uh, nothing was going my way uh, when I started so and even my parents they actually skeptically handed me a 
$250 check and, we'll, and they said, we'll see you in three weeks when I left. But I actually I kept that check the whole time in the glove compartment and on my 50th job I handed it right back to them. Said, hey, I was able to do it on my own. Yeah, so, yes. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, I'm sorry, I missed the Chrysler. Oh, you wanted to know because you went after companies for um, support for your. Oh, it's the sponsorship, yeah. Sponsorship. And oh, Chrysler, okay. Has many offers. Yeah, a lot of offers, a lot of job offers that I had to turn down even on the journey itself that weren't fitting my message or my, my mission at the time. So, all right, appreciate it. Thanks again. A, a great story, very inspirational. Um, a story about stick to itness. We've all been in situations. I'm going to try to put this back on without making a lot of noise. I think we, we've probably all been in situations where, uh, you know, like Daniel spoke about, where you had to deal with uh, rejection when you're out there looking for a job, whatever it might be. Uh, and it, this is just a young man who uh, who made a decision and then carried it through to the end. And uh, that's a great message, especially for those of you who are the students who are here and the younger ones who are just starting out, is that uh, you can do things that if you set your mind to it and and uh, and stick to it, you can do those kinds of things. I did have to say though, I, I uh, sitting here and paying attention to the crowd, and half of them are saying, "Man, that guy knows how to find jobs. He found 50 jobs." That's, those are the optimists. The pessimists are saying, that guy can't hold a job. <laughs> I also want to tell you that uh, Peg had told me, and, and he could probably expand on it, I hope you will uh, stop by and get a book and have him sign it. But he now works for the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois, and he's a track coach at the University of Chicago. Congratulations to you, and thank you for being here today. Okay, now we're going to get into the awards presentation, get to bring somebody up who I've had the privilege of working with when I was at the chamber. Uh, and then uh, now, uh, in all these years here at BCC and in her role here with co-op, I want to bring up Nicole Heaney. Nicole? Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. Um, every year we like to give out some awards to recognize um, some outstanding employers or supervisors and students. So I want to move ahead and first we're going to recognize some employers. I will say that the employers are nominated by their students and it's usually very difficult. We get a lot of nominations but um, we can only pick three each year but I do thank everyone else for um, all the work that they do in making this program run. Our first award this year goes to the Bristol County Superior Court Probation Department to Mary Vieira, the Acting Chief of Probation, and Mary Santos, the Assistant Chief. Come on up. I call them the Marys, and the Marys have been great because they take um, a variety of students, and they take students every semester. Uh, they take our criminal justice students, they work with our paralegal studies students, and they work with our legal office administration students. The reason that the students nominated them this year is because they're extremely accommodating and they're very supportive of student learning. Um, you know, it could be a job where you kind of file paperwork all of time in the back. As you can imagine, there's a lot of paperwork at the Fall River Superior Court Probation Department. But what they really do is they allow the students to see all aspects of the industry, which is great, and it's eye-opening for all the different majors that go there. So in addition to doing administrative tasks like filing and seeing all different documents, they also get the privilege of working at the front desk and dealing with the public in a high-paced environment. As you can imagine, would be a good learning experience. It's very uh, demanding group of people that are there working at the desk. They get to interview probationers, so they actually get to sit down with um, the folks who are on probation and do some initial um, assessment with them. They also get to shadow the probation officers and they learn how to develop the conditions of probation and get to see all the community resources that are provided to people who are on probation. 
Um, and one of the things the students like the most is they get to observe courtroom procedures. So all the students who are there have taken a year of classes and have read about arraignments and trials and pretrial hearings, but when they actually sit in the, in the courtroom, it brings it all to life. So they're taking the things that they've learned in a book and from their wonderful faculty, and now we're actually getting to see how it works in the real world. Another great opportunity is networking, and as Daniel spoke about, it's one of the main ways to find a job. So the students are able to network with probation officers, police officers, and even judges. One of the great things about the Marys is that they check in consistently with the students and they always assess to make sure that things are going well and they're learning what they want to be learning, that they're getting something out of it. Um, they always tell the students that they're great, doing a great job and they really make the students feel like they're appreciated. The students notice that um, they're great managers and the way that they show this is because the students indicate that they don't make a lot of mistakes. The reason the students don't make a lot of mistakes is because everyone in the office spends so much time really training the students in all aspects of what's going on so that they don't have the opportunity to make mistakes because they're so well trained. Lastly, as you can imagine, these two women both have high level, very high stress positions. Probably not a lot of free time to do all the things that they do with students. Um, but the students notice how well they treat their staff and they focus on how the staff is doing and they make sure that everyone is working at a team. And I'll just quote a student, she said, a happy team makes a happy boss and these women are great leaders. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, and I just found out Mary's a BCC alum. Uh -huh. That's great. <laughs> our second award goes to Susan Raposo. Susan it works at Bristol Community College in our Advising and Counseling Center. Come on up, Susan. Student, uh, Susan was nominated by her student, Allison Wilworth. Susan has been a friend to co-op for many years, and she's worked collaboratively, collaboratively with us um, since she was in job placement. Susan's being recognized because she's a natural teacher. Um, Allison had some good administrative skills and strengths, but she really needed to build her confidence and interpersonal skills, doing things like answering the phones, dealing with the public. Susan took the time to coach her in every step of the way. She stood with her while she made the phone calls, she gave her constructive feedback, and had the student practice these skills. She's very responsive to resolving any problems that came up and made sure that um, the internship was always student-centered. She took the time to focus, to help Allison understand the whole process and not just look at her tasks in a, a vacuum. And um, she always showed support in Allison's growth. And she went from working with Allison as a work-study student to an intern, and now Allison is working part-time in that department. BCC is fortunate to have Susan. She's been working with us for 34 years, and she's an alum of BCC. She's worked with many students over the years, helping them successfully transition from student to professional. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to recognize um, Rosemary Borden. Rosemary works at Precise Inc. as the benefits coordinator, and she was nominated by her student, Carrie Cordero. We had to do some sneaky work getting her here. She was on call, and we had to make a few phone calls with her boss, Bob, to get her here. <laughs> Did you ever meet someone who absolutely loves what they do? Well, that's what you see when you talk to Rosemary. She's in the field of HR. As you know, there's always changing regulations and laws and paperwork and detail and upkeep and stuff that I gloss over and go to a happy place. She loves it. She can't stop talking about it. She loves it. And her enthusiasm for that field bleeds over to the students that she trains. She goes above and beyond making every single thing at Precise a learning experience. She welcomes questions from students and she encourages them um, to ask those questions so that they really understand the big picture. So they're not just doing one little task and not understanding how it works into making the entire organization run. What most impressed Carrie about Rosemary is her commitment to continual improvement. Each semester she tries to improve the co-op program to make it a better learning experience for students while still meeting the needs of Precise. She models lifelong learning. The student was impressed that even after years in the field, she's still eager to learn. 
She instilled that you can never stop learning and you should never want to stop learning. And she exposed the student to so much more than just paperwork. As a result of Carrie's experience working with Bob in the HR department at Precise and through Rosemary's mentoring, Carrie has decided to continue on to UMass Dartmouth to major in HR management. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you can get mad at me later. Well, this year it was really challenging to pick just uh, a few student award recipients. We had so many great stories. As Peg said, we had 256 students. And I'm going to talk about four of them today, but I really could give you 252 very long, very interesting, very inspiring stories. Um, Many of the students this semester were offered, um, received awards or recognition from their companies. Um, we have students at the Fall River Police Department who are being honored. Many of our students, as Peg said, were offered jobs at the end of the semester, um, whether it's at South Coast Hospitals or the New Bedford Chamber or various other organizations out there. We've been offered a lot of positions. and. Um, the students have also served as representatives for the college, TV, media. I had the opportunity to be on WSAR with two students this um, semester to talk about the program. So the BCC co-op students are really out there and really serving as ambassadors for the college. Um, this was a challenging semester. Many students came and, you know, due to the recession and kind of it going on for years and years and years. It got to a point where a lot of students came and they knew what they wanted to do, but we couldn't find positions in that field. So we really had to sit down and I commend the students this year for taking a risk in that they tried things even though it wasn't exactly what they wanted to do. Um, they were really, really flexible this semester and they took risks and almost exclusively it paid off. Um, and most importantly, they were able through that process to develop transferable skills. This, um, the students that I'm recognizing today are chosen because they're really highlighting that BCC students go after they graduate and continue on for more schooling, stay in the area, and they really are the future leaders of the South Coast. So I'm going to highlight those students today. Our first student is Jeffrey Heeks. He's an environmental technology student who worked with SEAL and the South Coast Energy Challenge, mentored by Andy, Andy Erickson. Come on up, Jeffrey. <laughs> the South Coast Energy Challenge's mission is to reduce fossil fuel-based energy consumption by 15% among 15 households um, across the South Coast. So in Jeff's final paper, he admitted he enjoyed his internship much more than he thought he was going to initially, because he wasn't sure how working for this organization was really going to relate to engineering. Um, once he got in there and started to work on some projects, this idea changed. He was able to use the skills that he developed through his GIS class, and he created a canvassing map system that was able to track, all, track and keep record, accurate records of all the different households who were going to have energy audits, and then um, once they were, once they were um, audited, he was able to put all the information in and keep track of it all in a spreadsheet, which was amazing to be able to use that to, to use the GIS skills for advocacy. A uh, second goal for Jeff was to improve his verbal communication skills. I think it's safe to say without embarrassing Jeff too much is that he was always on the quiet and shy side. What better way to combat that than to be put in a role where you're doing community advocacy? So after being completely immersed in the home energy assessment market and learning everything he could about it, including giving mock HEA presentations to his boss, he was charged with going to large-scale events across the South Coast and having to pitch this idea to complete strangers. Jeff recognized um, that he needed, this to, he needed to improve in this area, and he hit it head on. He surprised himself, because once he developed the confidence and was talking about something, a subject that he was passionate about, he um, ended up getting a higher number of people to sign up for the audits than anyone else was able to do. He was successfully able to transfer the knowledge that he learned through his courses at BCC, enhance it with all the information at the South Coast Energy Challenge, and now is completely enmeshed in a network of other professionals who are passionate about the environment. Jeff challenged himself, and through his internship, he developed excellent communication and leadership skills. He is now qualified to be a trainer and will train future interns in the field of environmental technology. Our 
Our next student is Jason Feld. He's a business administration major, and he was at the Rhode Island Marine Trade Association, mentored by Wendy Mackey. Come on up, Jason. Thought I saw you here. Jason has worked. Jason's worked in the marine industry and more specifically as an expert boat builder for over 20 years. Um, although many of his positions required him to use some management responsibilities, he wanted to come back to BCC to get his degree in business. When we met, he wasn't exactly sure what he wanted to do, but he liked the idea of marketing and he liked the idea of mentoring youth. So we thought really hard about what he could do and um, we decided to place him at the Rhode Island Marine Trade Association. Here he was able to develop his business and marketing skills, as well as draw upon his many years and his wealth of experience in the field. His first project was to establish contacts for recruiting new members for RIMTA. Um, here he used many of his marketing skills and he had to use a lot of Excel skills. He was also able to participate in a lot of the planning sessions for the America's Cup Challenge, which will take place this summer in Newport. Lastly, and probably most importantly, he took the leadership role in recruiting for the Marina Trade Worker Training Program. Here he was responsible for recruiting, interview, and training youth for a summer work program to encourage them to enter the marine trades. Through this project, he assisted in grant writing and was able to fund the program, and now has been offered a position to help expand that program's offerings and to expand workforce development um, in Rhode Island. Jason used his expertise in the field, supplemented it with a college education, and as a result, has broadened the opportunities available to him. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Um, our next student is James Toomey. He's a business administration major in our geotourism program. <laughs> James, James was mentored by um, Bob Billington, who is a faculty person at BCC and is also the executive director for the Blackstone Valley Tourism Council. James had the opportunity to work on some very large scale and very intense projects this semester. He was in charge of the social media for the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame, where he also serves on the board. In addition to heading up all of the social media for that organization, he successfully coordinated the induction ceremony for all the newly honored members. Another project that he worked on this year was helping to write a $35,000 grant to the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management to help fund the Chocolate Mill Overlook Park in Central Falls. The council was awarded the grant and James has been assisting in the project management. He meets with architects, city officials, and others to give input on the layout of the park and um, which is part of what he's learned in his geotourism class of how to actually set up parks and make them so that they are sustainable and are good for the community. He gets to meet with community groups, including veterans, to decide where to place the monuments, how to accommodate kayakers, or any other issue that comes up. Um, what was probably exciting for him was he was able to go to the State House and shake the governor's hand and receive the grant money. There are too many projects to list that James has been working on with Bob this semester. This is all while he was in school full time. And on a personal note, I have the privilege of serving on the Commonwealth Ad Honors Advisory Board with James. He's also an honor student and gives up a lot of time to serve on the board where we um, comment and improve on all the honors projects that take place on campus. James is an intelligent, articulate, and creative thinker who cares deeply about his profession and developing tourism in a responsible manner. Through Bob Billington's mentoring, he is developing into an accomplished, accomplished community leader. Lastly, I would like to honor Keturah Mitchell. She's a paralegal studies and business major who worked at the New Bedford Community Connections Coalition and was mentored by Darlene Spencer. 
<laughs> I met with Katora quite a few times at the beginning of the semester because she was unsure about what, what path she wanted to take to do her internship. Um, this is not because Katora is not directed, because it is because she's interested and good at so many things. Uh, she knew she wanted to work in a field that made a difference, but she wasn't sure in what capacity. So after many soul-searching meetings, we explored some options. I introduced her to Darlene Spencer at the New Bedford Community Connections Coalition just to have a conversation to see if she could help her sort things out. It turns out they were a perfect match. Katora used her paralegal skills um, and was instrumental in instituting two very large projects that they had at the coalition. She researched both local and federal laws that pertain to the advocacy for foster children and more specifically to their educational attainment. She presented all of her findings and information at community meetings and helped the coalition formalize a platform that they were going to advocate for. Um, Darlene brought up a story that I thought was interesting that at one of those community meetings while Katora was presenting, one of our human service students was also at the table and she was remarking at um, how great it was to see that a young generation of community advocates from BCC are now part of the conversation of what's happening in that city. Um, her second project was helping bring a two-year-long idea to fruition. Katora took the leadership role in organizing a legislative breakfast to address how to advocate and improve educational attainment for foster children locally. I'm happy to announce that that legislative breakfast will be taking place on June 15th, thanks to Katora. Darlene and Katora couldn't be a better match. Working at the coalition and immersing herself in community organizing, Katora has determined that she'll go to law school and that she can use her brains and her advocacy skills to help society on a larger scale. So we had 256 great stories this, this year, from the summer, the fall, and the spring. Um, we were fortunate to have many, many bright and dedicated students, many of whom found their passion and were able to pursue it. And I feel very strongly about recognizing them because I do believe that the students who come through the co-op program are the people that you're gonna see as the business and community leaders for the South Coast. This is not just a nice program. This is not something that we come up here and everyone feels good for a day. This is much, much more than that. This is a true partnership for everybody who's in this room, from employers to students to our faculty, our community partners, our connecting activities partners, our advisory board members, our state reps, and for the administration of the college who support this program. The mission and outcomes of the co-op program work. In a difficult economy, we need to focus on programs that are working to educate our future workforce with a strong foundation in liberal arts and helping them to develop transferable skills that they need to be employable. And I thank everyone in the room for helping to make that happen. Thank you. Could I ask the award winners at the very end of the breakfast just to gather for one quick picture? Thank you. Well, you know, every year it's the same thing and no exception. Those were just some terrific stories that we heard today. And there are a lot of others, as Nicole said, that they had to try to select the best of the best. Um, and they were really uh, very powerful stories. Uh, same thing with the employers who are recognized here today and, and uh, the enthusiasm that's shown there and their willingness to, to, to help a student by offering a co-op and providing the supports to them uh, is evidenced in in uh, what we just heard about those students who, who were recognized here. Uh, this is the end of the program. I hope we'll see uh, most of you back here next year. I think it's a, a great celebration of two things uh, that really matter in, in, in our part of Massachusetts. Uh, one, and the re real reason why we're here this morning is because the cooperative education program at Bristol Community College works. It works exactly the way it's supposed to. And second, and Jack, to you and your entire team that you've assembled here and the work that you do, this college works exactly the way that it's supposed to. So thank you all for coming this morning. I hope you have a great day and hope we see you here again soon. Bye.